for those of you who weren't here last year, uh, uh, EPRI and, and the International NELM uh, got together to sponsor the conference. And um, since that time, there's been a, quite a few things that we've come to realize, and I'm going to talk about those today a little bit. So we're going to get back to some of the more mundane uh, data tracking for NELM uh, products. Uh, my name is Chris Holmes, uh, and uh, my colleague Krish was unable to attend. He attended last year, and uh, uh, he sends his regrets. Okay. So let me just give you a, a brief background what what EPRI is. Um, it, I think it helps a little bit to understand. The, uh, the U.S. market is such that we're primarily regulated, and the... Uh, it just doesn't make any sense for you know, 155 different electric utilities in the United States, each have their own R&D departments. And so what EPRI was founded on was the premise that if you pool everybody's interest in R&D, every electric utility's interest in R&Ds, pool all that money, and then meet with them a couple of times a year to report on the results and then to develop research needs for the coming year or years, then it's some more efficient uh, use of those R&D dollars. So uh, I work in the uh, power delivery area and we're, we've been interested in NILM actually since its inception back in 1988 uh, and uh, have continued on with that, that work uh, now. Now we don't we don't develop, we're not manufacturers, we don't do uh, algorithm development or anything like that, but what we do do is uh, we work for our electric utilities and they indicate to us, they come to us and say, hey, we want to be able to present some disaggregated price, infor or not price, but uh, usage information, maybe for price, but some usage information that uh, customers can use to better understand how they're consuming electricity. And you know we see these NILM devices. You know what? What do you think about it, Every? So we don't like to endorse anything. So we we just uh, will uh, work with the utilities and then work with manufacturers to uh, look at how effective they are at disaggregating those end uses. But one of the things that we've learned uh, far more importantly over the past year is really the importance of getting the use cases straight because different use cases have really different known requirements and what we've seen is that there's, there, there appears to be maybe a divergence between what the use cases are, what the expectations are by utilities and non-utilities and in those particular use cases and where we are as an industry in the development of NELM. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Anyway, uh, the pointer, where is that rascal? Yeah, I don't, you don't want me to point like that, do you? Yeah. Yeah. Where is that game? Oh, just right here, okay, all right, thank you. Okay, the, these are kind of the, what, what we've uh, focused on is the, uh, you know, the core, the core data information that electric utilities need is what do these loads look like? What and being able to predict for the next day ahead, as David indicated, it's critically important. As long as we have some level of obligation to serve, and maybe that's going to change. We don't know. Right now, it's it's here, and we're we're working with it. So what we like to try to do is um, is the development of end use load data for sector sector being residential, commercial, industrial, maybe some others, but generally speaking. We have sort of focused in on, on these four areas, non-intrusive load monitoring for the development of end-use loads, advanced analytical methods, and those would be, uh, oh, shucks. Yeah, okay. Uh, the uh, analytical methods for, and some of these are, are, are not particularly real time. The conditional demand analysis or CDA, for instance, is not, but just basically takes AMI data, matches it with survey data, and, and develops some diversified load shapes. 
diversified meaning they are average and based on uh, if you had a new customer come on that shape would sort of reflect on average what that that load might look like uh, deep learning uh, the neural networks is an area that we're uh, more interested in and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and then uh, advanced direct measurement uh, EPRI is developing with some uh, electrical uh, square D and, and the likes uh, sensors and smart circuit breakers things of that nature and then finally where do you put all of this particular data we have a repository that EPRI has created called the uh, the uh, Every load shape library. I'll show that here in a second as well. Okay, but over over on the right is sort of what the key uh, for us is that we've come to realize that there are far more use cases of interest that want to use known technology that we really haven't tapped into. Uh, this is the load shape library I mentioned. I'm, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly um, uh, because you can explore it yourself. And there's the URL, loadship.epri.com. The data is fairly old, and that's a concern for us. And we're trying diligently to update more and more of that data. Uh, but in this uh, age of IoT, people aren't really interested in sort of static real-time. Uh, they want they want much prefer the real-time data. And that's what we're trying to uh, develop. OK. Um, uh, just some. Give some the, the, the next two slides just show a little bit about what the source of some of the data is. Uh, we collected it over many years uh, in, in the seed uh, data, uh, center for end use energy data, engineering estimates. We're not big proponents of engineering estimates. It, uh, it's not good at capturing turning <coughs> points. And then whole premise, we have a, also have a whole premise database based on uh, PowerShip. So we get a lot of requests for what does a load shape look like for a grocery store, for instance? What does a load shape look like for a bank or a Quiggy Mart or things of that nature? So uh, we have those in there by regions. Uh, and uh, our, uh, our, our testing, and, and here's where we get into sort of the, the meat of what we've been doing, is... Uh, We've been doing uh, NILM evaluations over the past five years. We did uh, two U.S. rounds. Uh, just, the electric systems are different. Not, you know, that's not really all that critical. But uh, in fact, many of the manufacturers, as you well know, in, in Europe are also in the U.S. markets and vice versa. Uh, but we've done two U.S. rounds, 2012 and 2015, with four and then 10 uh, different products. And then last year we finished up, actually more closer this year, and I'm going to talk about these in more detail. The uh, European, uh, the European uh, product evaluation. All right. Um, and we had developed a number of uh, metrics. We use uh, uh, accuracy relative to the meter value. We use a root mean square deviation of the ground truth versus what the actual is on a, by the uh, individual end uses. And then we aggregate load weighted for the whole premise for an overall accuracy. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, and then we do just basically looking at whether there are false positives and false negatives. Uh, utilities are very important in that, making sure that if you say that there's a, a device there, that it is there, uh, because if you don't, then you have a credibility issue with your customers and they begin to think that it's not working properly. And of course, cost. Uh, this is our, this is in, uh, I actually work in Knoxville, Tennessee. Every's located in Palo Alto, uh, but we have uh, a number of labs and about 150 scientists that work in uh, Knoxville. This is our European lab that we set up. And what's key here is the fact that we brought in very efficient appliances from Europe. We shipped them over, paid the customs and the duties, and went through all the paperwork in order to get them uh, in, into our lab. And they use a lot of inverter uh, technology, or variable speed drive technology in the uh, compressors. And we see, we're going to see that that has an impact on the uh, ability for the, some of these devices to identify the individual loads. 
these were the, the basic classes of Milm product designs. There are a number of different ones out there. There's a fifth one that um, we haven't, we want to test, we haven't tested yet, but I'll get to that. So we have some, some very uh, medium frequency hardware that can either be um, mounted on the base of the, the meter, uh, the meter base itself. Uh, there are sensor CT clamps at the uh, at the service panel. Smart meter, where uh, the output from the metering itself provides the, the data, and then some secondary uh, uh, devices like Rainforest and the like that will output data directly from the meter. The fifth one is the would be also a CT, but it would be the the uh, high, very super high frequency megahertz sampling types of, of uh, identification. We have not tested any of those. All right, so um, the way EPRI works is uh, two things, to, to caveat this slide a little bit, is it's, it was this particular study, these are European results only, and these were paid for by uh, EDF and L and uh, uh, Gas Natural Fenosa. Um, yeah, and uh, you know they get access; they control the reports. So, uh, but what we've done is we've excerpted a, a little bit of these results with their permission, and we also anonymize all the results. So, uh, in this particular study, we had ten different funders. Initially, we had seventeen, but as things happen and data. Uh, you know, uh, data's missing, or because uh, we, we just run these tests for about a week. Uh, uh, some of the vendors chose to withdraw. And so we went originally from 17, and then we finally had a, a, a good, credible pool of 10. And we don't uh, release their names. So these are all anonymized. We anonymize them in a number of different ways. So you're going to see different labeling on these. But basically, these are samples that show that most of the devices that we tested do a really good job of detecting events. So when there's a change in load, they, they detect that because it's of, of, of the metering is, is very high quality. The real issue becomes when you get that event and now you've got to decide what is it? And the labeling then becomes far more problematic. And particularly when you have multi-state devices such as a refrigerator which may have five devices can pose problems and you get some interference and some confusion as to what particular device is actually being seen here and then the further complication that we've seen over the past year is the existence of these inverter based loads which now are not particularly unique uh, or maybe they're too unique. They're unique over such a wide range of outputs that it's difficult to isolate the individual events. So we've seen when that happens, some of the devices are unable to really uniquely identify them, and they end up over in another bucket of just we can't uh, recognize exactly what that is. That's a challenge for you all to figure that out. We certainly haven't. Anyway. Um, so here, for instance, they do a very good job, or they, or they uh, this is a, presumably there's a third point here that product A identified 13 disaggregated loads, B, 15 disaggregated loads, and product C, eight disaggregated loads with varying levels of accuracy. All right. Um, this, this particular slide, well, that's a, it's really a, quite an eye chart, isn't it? But um, what we did was we set up four different scenarios. We did a, uh, a large house, these are all residential, a large house weekday, large house weekend, which established a pattern of turning on, we, would, we program all of the equipment to turn on and off at specified times with the exception of the water heater and the uh, air conditioner, which are set by thermostat, and then let them run the way they normally would run for a, a single family home then we do a retired citizen home, so we have a, a different pattern altogether. And then we have an even more bizarre pattern with a college student flat where most of the usage occurs in the night and in the middle of the night. Uh, we were just curious if there was 
you know, that the, 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 the algorithms have the capability to actually look at the data and recognize it rather than making some assumptions about the, about the uh, patterns uh, a priori. So uh, what we found is that the, the, um, the, uh, they, there was a varying level of performance across uh, all of those various uh, types, so, uh, as you would expect. Not, I mean, not hugely, significantly different, but, but somewhat. Um, the, uh, I don't like this slide, uh, so I'm gonna zip over that. The, uh, so this is our preferred metric, is taking the 60 minutes uh, for one hour. If the GNOME device identifies it as a water heater, we know exactly what the water heater is. We take that difference, square it, add it up, and then, and then divide it by the total usage. And that gives us sort of an error, a proxy for an error. So the, 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 the wider it is, the less accurate it, it becomes. So you really need to take uh, one minus these values. And you can see that we're looking at, you know, one minus 0.38, uh, you know, 6.2. So 60, it, it captures 62% of the actual load. Um, you would expect bigger loads would be captured better, but the ones that are, uh, in, in particular, inverter-based, like the laundry and the uh, and, and the water heating here is a heat pump water heater. So even though it's a large load, it is also compressor based. Uh, those accuracies are, you know, in the range of 65 to 75%. And then when we load weight them, so if it does very well at identifying the load for a large appliance, uh, it ought to get more credit. Hence, that's why we do the load weighting. So under these various scenarios, you can see that they're all pretty much the same. So 60 minutes for the first product is around 68, 68, 69, uh, 70%, looking at a, a, an hourly load shape. For a 24 hourly load shape, 76, basically all the same. In the next product, very similar results. The Generally speaking, the daily is slightly easier to identify and, and the accuracy is a little bit higher for those. Here, we, the, the, the final product, we're getting up to, there's an 81%, so it's 81%. Okay, so the, uh, the upshot is that the, uh, the accuracy is not quite there for these particular products. Um, the uh, medium uh, uh, sampling rate uh, devices seem to work a little bit better than the CT clamp based products, but uh, wasn't all that great. Um, the um, copies of this will be available, so I'm just going to skip over the high points. Uh, all, all of the, uh, the, the event identification was, was excellent in, in all of the products. Um, let's see. And then. Uh, yeah, so um, actually we're sort of now going to focus more on the top five or six loads in the development of end-use load shapes for our, for our uh, load shape library. And then uh, the efficient loads for like heat pump water heaters, inverter refrigerators, electronic loads are, are making it difficult to uh, generally identify those end-use loads. All right, um, so I'm not trying to be the bearer of of difficult news here by any means. We want this to work. So what we're proposing is that uh, uh, we're gonna put together a collaborative uh, uh, activity with the utilities and manufacturers and other groups too. I mean, if there are, there, there are uh, energy efficiency organizations that are very interested in this as well in order to uh, do more uh, or other use cases such as energy audits, um, uh, appliance diagnostics, uh, and so there's a whole host of use cases. So what we're proposing, though, is the development a low-cost working group where we begin to parse out what each of the use cases are and work with the algorithm developers. All you know, mo many of you out there, uh, your algorithm developers and your hardware developers, in order to. Uh, get this, uh, get some of the, the, uh, 
accuracies up, uh, if you will. So that's what we're proposing. And uh, there'll be some information. Go, go to our uh, website or contact me or Krish Gomatom, and we'll give you more detail about it. But uh, the, um, the, the upshot is that it, for manufacturers, it's a nominal cost for things like $5,000 a year or something of that small amount. And for manufacturers, they would, for uh, utilities rather, they would they would bear the brunt of the expense. So um, that's kind of where we are. All right. Um, yes. So just to summarize again, what, what we really are interested in is making these devices more uh, applicable to a wider uh, span of use cases. Things that include pricing structures that would include. Um, diagnostics, energy efficiency audits, peer-to-peer -peer comparisons, um, as well as the development for uh, utilities for perhaps, you know, blockchain settlements sometime out in the future. So with that, that's, that's the latest from our end. Cool.